This is our first live episode of Human Factors Cast. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, and uh, you know what? We're so excited to be doing this here live on YouTube. And, uh, you know, if you're doing this on the normal route with a... Uh, with the RSS feed, uh, we're happy to have you too, but you can check us out every Monday and, uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I think we should, uh, just go ahead and start this thing. Yeah. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, Human Factors Practitioner. On the show today, in studio, yeah, we have Mr. Billy Hall. Hey, everybody. How's it going today? Oh, man. I'm excited. Like I, I am said. super jazzed about this. <laughs> this I was a cool. little scared when we started setting up. I was like, oh, gosh, they're going to see my face. They're going to oh, be like, dislike. Man. But now you guys get to see the sweet manly personage the, of the this studio too oh well yeah, yeah some studio yeah uh if you're listening uh go check us out on youtube like i said uh we'll be streaming every monday now or we're gonna try to uh-huh. anyway at six o'clock p.m pacific standard time uh do check us out um also not in the studio is uh we made a big announcement last week about blake arnsdorf joining the show and yeah. uh you know on his first day he ran away he uh <laughs> He left us. No, he he had to take care of some things, and so he'll be he'll be here next week for his first official uh, Human Factors Cast episode as uh, one of the uh, permanent fixtures. Yeah, he's so- like a, he's like a Doctor Quest right now. He's jet setting around doing science. Yes, yes. Well, um, so I just want to mention right out the, out at the uh, beginning here. Um, you guys should check out our Facebook page because uh, we're going to be talking about some amazing, amazing topics here coming up in a couple weeks, uh, like Psychology of Fear yeah. uh, next week, it's PlayStation VR scary. impressions. Yes, um, definitely. Lots and lots of cool things. Theme parks, uh, colors. You wanted to talk yeah, about I colors? Like the colors. Yeah, Mostly so, just uh, so I can say Duke, the colors, Duke, the colors. <laughs> so, yeah, go check it out. Uh, ask us some questions. We'll be sure to answer them on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, Billy... Yeah. What are we talking about today? We're going to be going into space. Space. I'm excited about this. Space is cool. Yeah, um, definitely cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, space is space is really neat. I listen to a lot of Star Talk. Um, and uh, I mean, you might be a little bit of a Star Wars fan. I mean. Yeah, but Star Talk is more like astrophysics and, and reality. Yeah, uh, but so I mean, that's kind of cool. That love of space, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Big Star Wars fan. Uh, this is not a Star Wars episode, though. We're going to try to keep it as grounded in reality as we can. Oh, that's um, no fun. So, <laughs> well, to you, maybe. Uh, space is cool. Right, right, yes. right. Okay, so... Um, yeah, this is this is a big deal. I'm kind of excited about this whole like live stream thing, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so first of all, let's just let's just set the groundwork. What do you consider space? So space, uh, in my notes, I have anything from low Earth orbit to mm-hmm. deep space. So actually, Blake is on a plane right now. Right. Uh, I would not consider that space. That's high Earth, or I guess, well, that's low Earth orbit. I don't know. Would that be space? Is that is, considered 15,000 feet is what they always say it is. Is, is that considered low I, orbit? I don't know. Is Blake in space right now? Suborbital? I, yeah. Blake is suborbital right now. He is flying through the sky. I'm thinking of that Louis C.K. routine. It's like right. we're flying through the air. We have Technological no marvels. Hey, right? Right, Man. yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so so I figured, you know, for this this discussion, I think we'd just take a different approach to the podcast today since uh, this topic was actually generated from uh, one of the panels that I went to when I went to HFES, which is uh, that conference where all the nerds get together, all the human factors nerds get together, and they, they talk about their Do scientific dark findings. Rituals. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, scientific findings and dark rituals and all that stuff uh but anyway um so so yeah what we'll do i guess is is just kind of talk about that panel yeah i'm excited about this this is one of the titles when we were talking about live from hfes with blake this was one of the things that really caught our attention and we're doing a show about it well yeah and you know i alluded to it um back on that episode but uh we didn't actually talk about it 
at all. Like I skipped over. I said there was a cool panel on space. Stay tuned. And now we're talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Let's so talk about that panel. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was uh, it was two people. So it was the director of the International Space Station, right? Uh, and he's like on the ground uh, in charge of all the missions and uh, you know all the basically all the inner workings of the space station. He he kind of sets up these things and just sends people up and tells you to do it. Um, and then there was a female astronaut. Oh, that's uh, so cool. Which is awesome. It was just right, awesome. Right, right, right. Uh, and she talked about some of the challenges regarding humans in space. Mm-hmm. Um, or they both did, really. And, and it was really interesting because you have these two perspectives. You have the user mm-hmm. and you have the director, right? So you have the person who's setting it all up. Right. And then you have the person who's actually doing things yeah 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 and then they have to communicate there has to be things like that and it's not like you can if there's a problem in the space station you just go out to the local home depot and shoot it up there right right yeah that's definitely in here so uh i mean let's can we just take a minute real quick and just acknowledge the fact of how amazing of an achievement the international space station is it's really it's spectacular i mean not only did a bunch of countries work together to make this thing but the fact that it's currently orbiting It's over space. our heads. It's in sp- it, We have people in space right now. Just hanging out and living. Human beings. No, that's super cool. Um, and uh, definitely one of the highlights for me was being able to shake um, Dr. Magnus, the female astronaut, right. her hand. And to say that I have, I have touched uh, another human being that has left this planet. That I don't think we give that enough credit. You know what? I would say I would almost qualify that with that is out of this world. Oh my! <laughs> no, 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 no! You're not no. going to give me that one. No. All right, I thought that was file that one away. All right, all right, all right. But so, I mean, so we always talk about the idea of um, users, right? Yes. So the astronaut would be considered the user in this situation. What yeah. You do, what you, if you were put on a space project, would design for. Right, yeah. So, so a human factors professional would come in and, and kind of design this uh, this workspace for these astronauts. Right. Um, yeah, and, and so the astronaut in that sense would be the user. But also, a lot of times, the astronaut is the designer, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Um, All right. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of those challenges they mentioned, and, and then we'll go from there, and we'll get to that. Sure, yeah. So, so the director of the International Space Station, he talked about the journey to Mars specifically. Oh, um, cool. I know. Isn't it neat? Uh, this so, is the world we live in. I know. So he, uh, yeah, he talked about um, the Martian and how uh, duct tape and plastic doesn't really fix anything. Or it doesn't fix everything. It fixes a lot of things, but it doesn't fi- – like Matt Damon would not have been able to pressurize the cabin like that. And yeah, he, he was going on about that, but – um, Richard Dean Anderson would disagree with you, but Guy yeah, oh, would disagree. I, oh, with you. I'm sure. I'm sure they would. Uh, and then they, <laughs> he talked about the phases of going to Mars, right? right. And these these were uh, these were broken down. Um, you know, there there's this whole short duration, right? So a right. few days to a few months. This is this is our astronauts actually going to the International Space Station mm-hmm. and coming back, right? This right. is this is very short term. And he was saying there's going to be this transition where we're going to go into this long term, uh, long duration mission where, um, you know, you have several years to get to Mars. You're on Mars for a couple months and then you have several years back. So it's like a five year mission. So instead of a couple weeks, a couple months, right, right. you're dealing with this longer term. And, you know, a, a lot of these things had like uh, or a lot of the issues, I guess, would be like the effect of gravity on the body. Right. Right. Because they said, like, what is it like? It's almost like a month to the moon and back or more. Um, like, I'm not sure. I'm not but sure. I, mean, I like, don't want to speak out of. I know. But I mean, like, it's one of those things. It's only like the farthest we've probably ever gone is like the moon and the moon I- and moon compared to Mars. That's a long, long trip. You know? Yeah. 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 No, definitely. Yeah. So there's there's a there's a big difference um, between going to the moon or low Earth orbit and Mars. Um but yeah, he mentioned one of them was gravity, mm-hmm. right? It's not making our bones work as hard um, to, right. su- to support our weight when we're right. weightless, uh, and they have uh, atrophy, right? Right, right, right. And so, I mean, like a lot of the ergonomic stuff that we talked about last episode, which actually is we- we're in a weird time right now because uh, the ergonomics <laughs> episode hasn't gone up yet, but yeah, uh, yeah. we've recorded it. So uh, it's like kind of like, like you guys are getting episode? a behind the scenes kind of look. No, and that's the purpose of this uh, these Monday. Um, right, right. These live streams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's to just kind of give you guys a like if you if you watch us on YouTube, you get like an inside uh, heads up 
That's yeah, you see all yeah. the little follies that we do and everything like that. Yeah. So um, this trip that they're taking there and going to Mars and things like that, we yeah. don't have cryo sleep things, right? That's Yet. not a mathematical thing. Yet. Okay, 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 okay. All right, I'll listen. I'll listen. No, 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 no. He didn't talk about that at all. Um, but he like there. That's not even in their plans, or at least they didn't talk about it in this panel. Um, but I mean, uh, I I mean, we're big nerds on this show, right? And right. and so this next part was kind of really cool to me. This uh-huh. this is where I was like, mm, he hooked me on this panel. Really? Yeah. So what he did was he compared uh, science fiction versus reality. Right. Okay. Okay. Because we have a lot of ideas of how it's supposed to be you know inertial dampeners and everything yes yes we have a lot of like and i mean science science fiction is everywhere right it's a huge influence on our lives but um no i mean he talked about some things that you might not necessarily pick up on if you're just watching science fiction because Mm -hmm. oftentimes science fiction is um you know just a metaphor for our lives currently but uh, a lot of the the themes in science fiction, so like uh, gravity on spaceships, that's not a thing. Wait a minute, I thought they had the whole like centrifugal force thing. Like if you spin real fast, it's like artificial gravity, but it's not you, gravity. You can do it that way. Um, they were saying that there was a lot of challenges with actually doing that because the speed at which it would have to spin would be super fast, and um, you know, orienting. Like imagine coming in from a weightless part of the ship to that, and then it's like just super fast, and you have to like get in. That's a challenge. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you wanted it to be slow enough, it would have to be really big. And so that's, that's a kind of out of their, out of their, uh, Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. I'm getting the science behind that. Yeah. So, uh, they talked about the amount of space on spaceships. Like you walk into the, 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 I don't know, what are the bridge of the starship enterprise? Is that what it's called? Yeah, buddy. How much room is in that place? Well, I mean, come on, just look at the, the millennium Falcon too. Well, they Hey, that, the millennium Falcons cockpit is really tiny though. What I'm saying a little kitchen in there though, like a big wide kitchen. I wouldn't think that would be a thing. No, no, no. I'm not saying star Trek versus star Wars here. I'm just saying the cockpit, the, the, yeah, the yeah, space yeah. in which you operate the thing. Right. Um, is big, wide open and luxurious looking. Damn it. We said we wouldn't use Star Wars references on the show. Okay. We, we're, we're, we're grounding talking, it. We're, we're talking about know, science fiction. I know. I know. Um, so, so yeah, they talked about that. Uh, <laughs> um, and they talked about food. Now, this was interesting to me because they talked about food, right? And in science fiction, it never deteriorates uh, in nutrition. Mm-hmm. And that's a real challenge for them is they have to make food. And, and they have like a food designer. They have a food designer. That designs food that is both that both tastes good, mm-hmm. that is appealing, mm-hmm. and that doesn't decay in nutrition. Well, isn't that where we like get Dippin' Dots and Freed Stride stuff and Tang? I guess. I mean, it's Tang. tang. It's what the astronauts <laughs> drink. Don't you remember those old commercials? I do. With the tang. monkeys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they have food designers i thought that was cool um, dude i wonder what the actual like human factors for designing food like those little pouches and like the little like that's go-gurts. an industry yeah should we do an episode on that uh, absolutely we need a whiteboard like right here oh that, that would be so just cool just has our show ideas yeah and we have a little like human factors logo on the back of it oh uh, sweet um so yeah and then they talked about this one was interesting too life support right science fiction never uh mentions how it operates on the spaceship you just always have oxygen Right, and that's something uh, that they really have problems with is providing oxygen and removing carbon dioxide from the cabin. Yeah, that's the thing. We take that kind of for granted. I mean, even if an airplane's there, sooner or later if it flies low enough, it gets oxygen. Yeah, and this one this one went way over my head. Radiation. Like, it's, right? Like, if they're close to a planet that has radiation? Not even. Just they're constantly bombarded with radiation when they're in space. There's nothing really? blocking. Yeah, because we have this magnetic field on Earth that... The sun, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, dude. It's like putting people in a microwave. Right, yeah. So so science fiction almost never covers the radiation and space aspect of science. You know, I hate to thing. do this to you, but Star Trek covers all these things. All right, well. real. Yeah, so, <laughs> so there's a ton of photons <laughs> right, coming right, towards right. the ship uh, from stars, blasting the astronauts, right, and spacecraft with this radiation. And it's like, how do you combat this? Huh. Well, I mean, like. It would be a long term mission, but don't the, 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 the International Space Station people do shifts? Like they only do go on for so many months Short and then term. they get off. Right. Yeah. But you couldn't do that with a long flight. And I mean it was really interesting too, because he didn't really seem too optimistic about solving this issue. It's like there's nothing you can do other than, you know, try to mitigate it. 
can't we just put lead in everything? I mean, like, isn't that the universal thing? <laughs> How heavy is lead? It's space. What does it matter? Well, getting the lead to space. Huh. I think, oh, he said, oh, he said a statistic in there that I meant to write down. It was, uh, it was like every pound costs something like $20,000. Oh, I've to heard space. this thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like It's something crazy like that. Every little thing you bring counts towards yeah. what you can take. Yeah, and I mean, you know, he... You hear that. But then right. when you hear the director of the International Space Station say it, you're like, okay, uh, all okay. right, it's real. I believe you now. All right, okay. Um, yeah, so he went into talking about um, NASA has this human research program, and this is more of the human factor side of things, right? Right, right. I just thought the science fiction thing was interesting for us. But, uh, yeah, he talked about um, sort of these three main components – uh, with the human research program. And this is this is all human research. This isn't just human factors. This is like um, psychology of what happens uh, when you're isolated in space and psychology of being in close quarters with other people. Uh, so environmental health, um, like I said, food. That's These a, things don't normally come into play in human factors? I mean, they do, they do, but like not as prominent as the space human factors engineering branch of the human research oh, it's a focus kind of yeah thing. kind of like yeah. the idea of abnormal psychology versus regular psychology you know both of them but one focuses more on the other sure yeah okay so um yeah but the space human factors engineering branch they kind of cover you know human computer interaction right? right so so like how do the astronauts interact with computers with or without gloves on or gear on like oh, yeah, 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 you have yeah, to build yeah, yeah. something for them with you know when they're outside to because work on these the big... on these big panels, right? Right, right. Um, how do the astronauts operate equipment that was designed to be compact and mm -hmm. not necessarily more usable, right? Because like we said, it takes a lot of money to send stuff into space, and right. so oftentimes you know engineering requirements will make things really tiny, and um, you know they'll build to the specifications of the engineering requirements and not necessarily like it might cost a couple extra bits and pieces to move that control over here, which would be more usable, but this mm -hmm. is more cost efficient. So how do you train them on those types of, um, th those types of how equipment? How do you balance the two out? Yeah, exactly. Like, okay. what's the cost benefit analysis to that? Uh, and then you like, how do you, how do you marry these two concepts of usability and engineering, uh, for the astronauts? Like, how do you, but that, that's, that's but what I we mean, were just talking about. An engineer about. is making, these items wouldn't they take that in consideration right yeah no but that's what you're saying like what's the balance right like right, what's right. how do you how do you marry okay. the human factors with the engineering part of it okay yeah. okay okay um they talked about mission process and task design now this was interesting to me because uh this is like um this so this is uh somebody actually designing a mission to be uh user friendly mm -hmm. now that's cool yeah. Right. Because they're sitting there and they're they're um, they have to consider, you know, is the astronaut going to be bored doing this? Um, are they going to uh, like what kind of uh, situational awareness are they going to need of the spaceship to do this task? What kind of um, uh, what kind of other factors are involved with all this mission? And I just thought the mission aspect of it, because that's not something you so, typically think about. Right. Like, so like, say, for example, they are on a long mission to Mars or something along those right, lines. Right. Right. The guy knows that there's going to be, by the time they get to the right point at the right time to launch this mission, get to that location, there's a really cool asteroid there that's gonna, or a comet that's going to fly by real safely. Right. They would actually say, okay, right now we need you to you know, hit the thrusters, turn on an axis a little bit, and watch this asteroid go by because that's just because of the idea, one, they get some scientific data, and two – the astronauts have something interesting to look at for a little while. Yeah. And, oh, man, is, I'm so glad you said that. Um, there's uh, – I have it later in my notes. But um, they were saying, like, you might want to design things to break on the space station. You might be thinking, what the heck? Because that's exactly what I thought. What? Why would you want to – you know how, like – um, computer manufacturers or or tablet manufacturers or phone manufacturers design their stuff to only have a lifetime of like a couple of years. So right. that way you come back and buy more. Right. It slows down after a couple of years. Right. Well, you know, for the astronauts, they do this for different reasons. So they actually design things to fail to keep the astronauts busy. Yeah, but... So, so okay, you're on a two-year mission to Mars. Right. 
You're in space. What are you doing? It's not a catastrophic failure. No, no, right? no, 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 no. No, it's no, more like, I'm not saying like it's they. It's more like a bunch of bulbs went out type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that kind of thing. So they, they design it in the sense that like it's repairable and it's not going to cause any major damage. But it will still like keep them alert and go, oh, something's broken. I got to fix this. It gives them a routine. Yeah, but they don't know when it's happening, so it keeps their vigilance high. Oh, right? I see. So, yeah, so it, it was really interesting to hear about that. That I, I, I think we talk about that later. I wonder but, if they uh, utilize that in other aspects of the world. Oh, like, I'm sure. You know, like, I'm with, sure. Like at plants. And so, so for industrial one e- complexes. Yeah. So one example. Um, think about like the TSA when you go through an airport. Security, right. Right. They actually, in terms of vigilance, they send through um, fake bombs all the time. Oh, I've seen news reports about that. So, so they actually, it's to keep their vigilance up. So they're, they're monitoring these things. And, you know, after like 15 minutes, your vigilance just drops. Oh, right. Uh, right let's right. do an episode on vigilance because that's a, all right, write it down it down. on the, uh, but yeah, no. So, so yeah, they, they do that in other applications as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so yeah, uh, they, they went on to talk about like human autonomy integration. So like, how do you, um, you know, how do you, integrate the human with um autonomous systems so like the spacecraft is going to be on automatic mode most of the uh, most of the trip right when you switch it back over to the human like how will they know what's been going on and what systems are up and running and which ones are down and how kind of like the whole readout thing right right yeah like how do how do you how do you get the human to take control again Mm -hmm. um then you have human robot interaction uh like with the uh grappling arms on the spaceship uh, you know, like for uh, external, so they send out like robots to the external, uh, to the oh, okay. outside of the ship, so they don't have to go out there themselves. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so that kind of thing, uh, training, um, which training is how just astronaut training on the ground, anywhere on the ground in space. Um, so they would be also training while going on that location. Uh, maybe yeah. So well, they they talk specifically about like how to. MacGyver like they have MacGyver training basically like how do you how do you solve a problem using what you have paper clips and chocolate bars they don't have paper clips or chocolate bars in space then I don't know what they're going to do I don't know either. <laughs> uh, and then they also talked about like medical emergencies like all of them get medical training so that right. way they can help each other at well, least stabilize them yeah uh, and then they also talked about like habitat and vehicle design right like how do you it's like it's like being an architect, right? How do you design this space that, uh, you know, has landed on another planet or that's in space uh, to be optimal for the astronauts? Right. Giving them more like maybe rounded surfaces on their habitat. So it looks bigger than it actually is. Maybe things that, like that or providing them a window, which has like a lot of psychological benefits. I have that later in the notes. OK. We'll talk OK. About okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah. And then vehicle design too, like. The little rovers. The rovers, the landers. The landers. All that stuff. Oh, that's so cool. I want to drive one of those man, landers around. They look the, so cool. I got to say, man, this was like the coolest panel I went to at HFES. Man, and, why aren't you working for NASA? Uh, they they're won't take me. me. down. They won't take me. That's because they're no. people of science and you're people of dark magic. Man, and I know I know some people um, were really bummed about not being able to see this. Uh, and so I know we have at least one listener out there who is watching right now. Um I'm probably really embarrassed embarrassed that I just called her out, but she was she was really excited about this, mm-hmm. um, and she didn't get to go. So oh, so hopefully, I'm sorry to hear that. Hopefully, hopefully us talking about it is uh, fulfilling that. Um, right, we get to look at our beautiful faces. Yes, she's watching on the stream. Um, right. So let's see here. Uh, some of the other goals of the space human factors engineering uh, for the upcoming years: human performance analysis. Mm-hmm. Right, how are they doing? Uh, design, obviously, decision making. Um, you know, the normal human factors. Right, stuff. right, right. Uh, digital modeling tool development. Uh, so how do they make tools in digital? Like, how are they designing the tools in digital environments? Um, what do you mean? I'm they're, sorry. They're literally designing the tools in, like, Blender or uh, they probably don't use Blender at NASA. But, um, you know, software programs, they are making... The, like physical tools, they are modeling them in these environments. Do you get me? Oh, kind of like CAD designer with like yes. jewelry and everything. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. That's that's one of their focuses for the upcoming years. Uh, I actually went digging a little mm-hmm. bit because this this interested me a lot. Right. Um, right. And uh, I found a, a NASA document 
Uh, oh, it's it's not secret. It's not secret. Oh, either. There's, I know. You got me excited there. I know. I thought we no, were this is, about aliens. This is public domain. Oh, first thing on here, aliens. It's in alphabetical order. Nice. No. Uh, so no, they wanna they wanna cover everything between the physical, sort of informational and environmental and socio so psychosocial aspects. Psychosocial. I'll get there. Okay. Of human performance, right? Um, so psychosocial is like how do people interact with each other? How do you and I talk on this podcast? Are we friends? Are we like once these cameras go off, am I a total dick to you? Like yes, okay, but both. No, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, no, no. So, I get what you're saying. Though. So like, how do how do people interact? And like, what kind of social sort of standards are there for different countries? So like, uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit. So so Dr. Magnus was talking about how like Russians don't shake females' hands. Really? Is that really a thing in this day and for, age? For for like business? Yeah, they don't. Huh. And so she was like, look, I respect that. And if I'm not like a central part of what we're talking about, I won't shake your hand. That's fine. But when I am in charge of a mission, you better shake my hand. Makes so sense. so it's compromises. Right. So she's right. asking you, them to the compromise. Halfway. And yeah, she's she's acknowledging that that is a tradition of theirs. And so. So, yeah, it's like, how do you get these two sort of uh, culturally different um or, or two or more people to right. work together. Right. With it's, political yeah. differences and things like that. So, so yeah, this NASA document talks about communication, which is uh, exactly what we just talked about. But in a broader sense, it also talks about how, like, mission communications come in and out, right? Um, like from, like, uh, Houston and stuff yeah. like that? Or yeah. Beijing, I think that's where the Chinese one is. They talked about, like, messages uh, and delays of messages and limited bandwidth. What do you mean delays in messages? So, like, you know it takes, like, eight minutes to get to the sun, for light to get to the sun and back. Right. Or to get to the sun and then eight minutes to get back. Right. Um, and so, very similarly, it takes a couple seconds for us to talk to the International Space Station. And it takes a couple seconds for what we say. So, we're talking right now on YouTube, and if they're watching, they'll see it a couple seconds hey, later. Guys. Hey, astronauts, if you're watching. What's up? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, if they were to say, hey, guys, love the show. I just liked and subscribed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're always doing this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if they were to do that, though, it would take another couple seconds to get back. So there's that delay of communication, right? Right, and, right, And right. you get this with, like, the rovers to Mars. It takes, like, what, half an hour to get there? How do they put in commands like that, then? So uh, a lot of it's um, predetermined. So they... They'll uh, they'll they'll have like onboard systems. This is this is about humans. I'm well, sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. Right, We're right, talking about right. rovers. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, There's so many questions about space. It's such an interesting topic. If you want that, go go listen to Star Talk. But I mean, we should cover it at some point. But uh, I, I, the, at least the introduction with delays. Speaking of which, they have a book, and I don't know if it's on Audible.com, but I just want to thank our sponsor, Audible.com, for sponsoring this podcast today. If you go to Human Factor or Audible.com, AudibleTrial.com, wow, so I messed I that one up. I told you it's not easy. I know. AudibleTrial.com. AudibleTrial.com slash Human Factors Cast. Get your free 30-day trial. There's tons of books. I I found a new trick. I listen to them at like almost twice the speed, and I get through them twice as fast. I've gone through so many books in the last – well, I worked my way up to it. Okay. So now I'm listening it twice fast. Like every every day I would up it by like 0. 0.1. Why? So like 1.1. Because, dude, there's so many books that I want to listen to. Well, yeah, but I get it. But the, that actor worked really hard in that performance. Yeah, and I just hear it twice as fast. Does it have the same inflection or are we yeah. getting chipmunk moments? No, it's not chipmunk. They they – Rate or they they increase the speed but lower the pitch so that way like it stays the same. Uh, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, this is old technology, man. All right, so let's get back to this uh, space day, space stuff. Um, oh yeah, one more time. AudibleTrial.com slash Human Factors Cast. Get your free thirty day trial today. It's great. Uh, so um, and thanks again, Audible. Thank you, Audible. So uh, they talked about human interaction with information and automation. We already talked about human autonomy and integration. This is again from that document. Mm-hmm. Um, we got uh, data analysis and distribution. So, like, what uh, human interfaces do you need for effective and efficient data presentation? So, like, how do you show data effectively mm -hmm. um, in these environments, right? And that's a, that's a really big thing. That's not exclusively to NASA, but that's that's a problem that they're working on currently. So, how do you streamline like 
like, you know, altitude, measurement, speed, distance, things like that efficiently, right? Right. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Design and development, testing, evaluation. So human factors, guidelines for tools, facilities, crew aids, fasteners. There's a lot of stuff here. Wow, I got like three pages of notes on this this one NASA document. They're yeah. thorough. No, well, I mean, they got to be. When they don't, things blow up. They're thorough. Safety, medical facilities, uh, module features. This is cool. What do you um, mean module features? Specific human factors requirements for mission-specific modules, such as effective controllers for robotic manipulators. Wow, this is really complex wording. Wouldn't it be really funny if we get up there and we find out it's just a PS4 controller hooked up? You know, they do have that. Yeah. That's like they, they've done that. Like uh, in um, – some military applications, a lot of their users are gamers, too. And so they just handed them a controller and said, look, here you go. Right, right. I mean, that's how a lot of the drone stuff and all that stuff developed because they just took things that were existing. Right. Okay. There's there's dangers in making people think that taking lives is a game. I've read that book. We just got real, man. Oh, dang. All right, let's get back to a fun topic, space. Space. Uh, <laughs> space. Tools and equipment, uh, workforce characteristics. Uh, let's see, like what kind of psych- psychosocial we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, workload and tasks. So this is kind of backing up what that guy was saying. Right, right. Right, I mean, yeah. He kind of went over know, this he, briefly. I but bet. I mean, you know what would be interesting if he actually wrote work this? Environment. Yeah, I, I didn't look. Yeah. I didn't look, actually. And I bet you it's drafted by a lot of people, but um, right. I bet you he is definitely involved in it. Uh, habitability and work environment we talked about training see, we just talked about see that's per, that's an interesting thing because Which I one? mean the work habitability and work environment I really find that one kind of interesting because of the fact that you know you're like we're friends we like yes. each other we like spending time with each other on camera right right in if we ha- we're in a garage right now but let's say for <laughs> let's say for a minute here though that we had to spend six months in this garage The together. poor listeners that have no idea what's going on. <laughs> but I'm serious. No, no, no. Yeah. Six, so min- six, six months. We spend an hour here every week. I mean, sure. I bet we could spend a whole day together, honestly, or at least maybe even a long weekend. We have. We did on Saturday. Right, right. We did. We did. Right. We played games. We played games. But I mean, like, what I'm saying Board is- Board games. Go check out that episode. Love it. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is that- the the human factor and design that you would have to come up with in the architecture of designing these little habitats to make sure that, you know, one astronaut doesn't strangle another astronaut. I mean, I know they do, like, <sighs> psychological testing and things like that, but... Like the design of the actual space. Like the design of the actual space. Like, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's in my notes later. Oh, uh, dang uh, it. It's I okay. keep doing this. I'm it's so okay. excited about it's okay. this. You know, you should just really read, just read the show notes before we... I do read the show notes. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, you know what it is? It's it's uh, information creep. So right. you read the show notes and then you uh, get all these ideas and then right. it creeps into your conversation earlier. And that's fine. I mean, that's oh. fine. It's like it, it makes the conversation flow. And no, it, it <laughs> perfectly fits. It's interesting. Um, but I do have it later. OK, we'll because, talk about it later. Because I want to I want to make sure that we give Dr. Magnus the female astronaut credit for where she said these things. So. Oh, right. So. Uh, so I mean. Yeah, so uh, let's see here. Habitability. Yeah, we just talked about that. Training, mission support. Um, so this is like that uh, mm-hmm. communication. Uh, maintenance and logistics training and crew performance, right? Oh, everybody else that we're actually just going over this stuff too. When the show comes out, we'll also be able to put this document up on our Facebook and probably I'll uh, share a link on the on the YouTube as we well. We can, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you can that. keep up with this. Now, are you, are you guys ready for the kicker? Because uh, – Here's the kicker. Oh, I'm excited. That was just the first person that <laughs> talked about all that cool stuff. Man, that must have been a cool little seminar. Why oh. don't they stream these seminars? They don't. They don't. It was so cool. And I wish, I wish we could have, um, you know, caught it on video or something. Because right. it, was, it was just phenomenal. It would be like, so much more interesting if they streamed a lot of these. Like, things. okay, so I, I literally got in there and I, like, sat down and from – like the second they started talking and all the space images up on the screen, I was captivated. Oh, I was did just they show a lot of pictures of ISS oh. and stuff like that. Oh, they showed so many cool pictures. Oh, that's so yeah. Cool. I wish I could bring some up. I mean, I, I could capture um, the screen, but then our listeners would uh, not have that. Right. 
Anyway, uh, so so that was the kicker, uh, was that that was just one person. So now let's talk about what uh, Dr. Sandra Magnus talked about. Which I would like to say how much of a kicking name that is right there. That is. Like, you don't want to mess with that. Like, oh. I'm Sandra Magnus. Dude, and she was no, like... No BS. She was all about like she was. She was all business. All business. Like well, she, she would have to be. You know, she gets stuff done. Right. She must be like. Strict. Oh man. Um. Yeah. I so she goes by the name Sam because Sam Magnus sounds like just a cool pulp novel name. Sandra. Uh, S- Sandra. Sam. Yeah. Maybe she goes by Sam. Sam Magnus, PI, astronaut, adventurer. So yeah, uh, sh- she brought the interesting perspective of the astronaut talk right. this discussion, and that was right. that was really cool. So there's like this big contrast with the first guy who saw things from the program perspective, like what do we need to do in the next couple of years to make all this happen, versus uh, you know what it's like to actually be up in space. Mm-hmm. And uh, and all this cool stuff. So I mean, she talked about living in space. Is what? She, oh, that is so cool. <laughs> so cool. I mean, like, seriously, we will. You and I will probably never see space. Never ever. Well, who knows with Elon Musk? Like, well, yeah, but that's going to be stupid expensive. Well, do you think he's going to have like a deal day, a little coupon day? I mean, who knows? I mean, he'd probably have Tesla for rockets or something. Like, I don't know. Tesla for Uber for rockets. U- Uber rocket. Rocket Ubers. Uber rocket. I don't know if he could actually get away Uber with calling rocket. something Uber rocket. The, the, yeah, the Department from. of Defense would probably be all over Hold that. I'm gonna shut minute. you down. Uh, last time we got this. <laughs> oh man, this is not North Korea. Uh, Uber <laughs> rocket. Would you like to order a missile strike today? <laughs> Call Elon Musk. Just kidding, Elon. Um, if you want to send us Teslas, we will totally We will totally take Teslas. Totally Just take saying. Uh, so, <laughs> no, she talked about uh, living in space, right? And so she t- she told this cool story about, like, you know, when you're up in space, you see the Earth. And it's totally – it's just in your – field of view and it just takes it's beautiful it's magnificent you look at it and you just cannot pictures cannot do it justice like it's like when you take a picture of the grand canyon yeah and then you go to the grand canyon and you're like whoa whoa i thought this was just a whole hole in the ground but this thing is humongous or or you like take a picture of the city and you just don't appreciate the scope until you go to the city and you're like whoa these buildings are so tall how did man build these things right 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 and so she was talking about the same kind of um relationship with space when you look at the earth it's like you take pictures but it doesn't capture its beauty it's like and what sucks is that we'll never experience that no we won't in our lives ever i mean likelihood even our children might not even experience that Oh, who knows? But but she she said that and then she said, you know, when when people do go to Mars, right. It's going to be a completely different thing because they will see it in their rear view. So they're going to literally see Earth shrink from this magnificent jewel in the sky and as they get further and further away, it'll just become smaller and smaller and smaller and pretty soon their home where they were born and raised will just be a dot in the sky can you imagine the psychological wear in your mind that is exactly what she was saying what will that do to them i mean how do you not just like get on your knees and scream every single thing they have ever known they have ever loved is on that planet and they're leaving away from it and it's just becoming a little they can cover it with their thumb understand i mean like we get when we're kids we get homesick when we walk drive away from our house the internet Human factors cast. They're not going to be able to listen to the podcast anymore. They can they're just download gone. It off of iTunes. <laughs> well, yeah, NASA would have to send them the file. I think they could still do it. I they guess. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, new episodes. They're, they're fine. They're fine. They're fine. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, like, I always thought that Mars always just looked like you know the desert of Arizona. But I mean, like, you think they would actually rationalize that in their head? This is just like. I don't know. That's interesting. Like, I I bet you being on another planet like that has. Like, we've only ever been on the moon, and there's right. only been a couple people on the moon. And usually it's pretty euphoric from what they've all said. Right, and so it's like, well, yeah, what kind of experience will that be stepping off the spacecraft for the first time, stepping onto Mars, a completely alien planet? Oh, can like, you imagine the looking first... up into the sky and saying, wow, Earth is out there somewhere? Like, that is just, that blows my mind, man. You want to know what the biggest thing is? What's that conversation going to be like right before, after they open the hatch? Who gets to go first? Oh, I'm sure they. I'm sure they decide that a long time. No, I don't know about oh, that. Yeah. Though. I mean, like Neil Armstrong. And, I mean, like name the other guys. 
Uh, Buzz Aldrin. And? And uh, the guy who was in the rover. Yeah. Or not the rover, the uh, orbiter. Yeah, see what I'm saying, though? <laughs> yeah. No, I know. I mean, just that. No, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, showing my lack of lack of. No, uh, it's okay. I don't knowledge. know who he is either. That's okay. just the thing that people know. And we're I'm sure educated. people will comment on our YouTube right? or our SoundCloud like, oh, with whoever it was. And yeah, be like, like, you guys are idiots. Pages, the rover guy's fan page. You guys are idiots. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, they talked That's about. That's crazy of an idea, though. Okay, it so just blows my mind. So, so we got to move on to the next one. Right, 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 right. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know that one just. It's, it's, it's just. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> I it just it blows my mind. Okay, so uh, the next one she talked about was like the living quarters in the space, and this is what you mentioned right, earlier. Yes, this living is what quarters. I talked about. Yes, so um, she talked about how like everything is right next to each other, right? So you have like uh, food next to crew uh, who are sleeping. Uh, which is next to the treadmill, right? Right, and which you can't use if people are sleeping because it's right next to them, and you can't get food if somebody's on the treadmill because literally the treadmill folds down over the kitchen, and so and then like they have to design everything to be compact, right? Right, and right. so there's a lot of competition with who uses what when, because you have you have this resource management that you have to deal with while you're on on board, and um. You know, living in space is tight. They can't, they have to, not like tight, like 90s tight. Like. I eat. I eat. Tight. No, like, uh, like cramped. It's right, right. claustrophobic. Like, and like, it's like if we had to spend six months this far away from each other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, with a, with a couple extra hallways and a couple extra, like, places yeah. to do, like, our kitchen is there and our treadmill is here. I would walk by the door. I'd see you pooping. I couldn't unsee that. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Same, same to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, no, but I mean, seriously, that's well, not a joke. That's interesting too, because she talked about poop. She, well, she talked about waste. Be, I think that would be a very important thing to talk about. But I think go so on. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She talked about waste, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, you know, and she was t- also talking about windows. I and mean, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, too. We, she talked about windows and how that has, like, a huge, profound, she used the word profound, psychological effect um, or experience, right? Because uh, you get to see outside of this cramped quarters, hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also very expensive to engineer. I would imagine so. So, so yeah, so... More windows and happy astronauts, or less windows and uh, you know potentially safer, potentially um, less expensive. Like, does the cockpit have a large window in it? Not large, no. And uh, I don't. You're thinking of the space shuttle, yeah? Um, because the International Space Station doesn't have uh, oh. any sort. I mean, it has controls, but it doesn't have any sort of like cockpit. Like, you can't move it if you wanted to. Right, right, right. Um, but I meant like what I'm saying is, is that do they have like any of those things where you can like. Like a, a viewing. Oh yeah, deck. they have they have like a dome shaped, uh, like out, like outrigger, uh, area where you can just kind of look out and sit in this dome and look in any direction and see. I think that's the place I would never leave. Well, yeah, yeah, but there's you, you bet you there's competition for it. I would imagine. Um, like out, like you have to do a sign in sheet. Yeah, speaking of poop, uh, trash on board the International Space Station, so they have to inventory all their trash. Um. Yeah, because right. I get it because everything of waste that you make has to be noted on weight. Um. Yes, and and then well. Yes, and then there's also the whole aspect of like, um, the. Here's my notes. They uh, okay. Yeah. So so she was talking about how like, when you pack stuff to go on board the space station, everything right. is nice and neat and organized and packed nice and neatly. Uh, but once you take something out of the box, like it never fits right the same way again. Right, because everything's like, like probably like vacuum sealed and everything. Well, yeah, like it's that. vacuum sealed. I mean, just think about like, um, like your Amazon packages. If you were to like uh, open something, like try putting something back in the packaging exactly how it was before. Mm-hmm. Like you can't. Right. It's just it's packaged in a way that like prevents you to do it. So, uh, so yeah, they do have to inventory trash and keep track of it. So that way it doesn't get out of hand, right? So they, like, they put it in certain places. They have a whole storage system. It's really interesting. Why don't they just jettison it out into space? They do. Okay. Upon reentry. So, it so, burns up. Yeah. Why don't they do it before? They don't want to pollute space. They, 
they just want to send it in. They want to be sure it goes to the Earth's orbit and blows Burns up. Burns up. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. Right. All right. I can. I mean, like. But that's a good question. I don't know why they just don't like jettison it out. Like, like I mean, you, is it? I mean, like, like if what, you if it shoot something? it out, like, or? like at the power of like, if you let go of a helium balloon, technically it will never stop, right? Right. Right. So I mean, like, it's not necess- It's gonna hit something. I mean, what are they afraid of? It's gonna hit like these aliens are gonna come in and be like, we're gonna make peace with Earth and talk to them, and then bam, poop. Right. <laughs> Just on the like, windshield? Nope. We're turning around. <laughs> on the windshield, they, like, turn on the windshield wipers? <laughs> like, what is oh, that? Oh, man. <laughs> um, she talked about that famous Ender's Game line where there's no up in space. Um, is that true? Mm, yeah. But there are some pieces of the International Space Station that are built like there was. So the lights are on the ceiling. Is that to maybe make it feel a little bit more or less... Like I think it's more or less to orient the astronauts to like where things are. So like if they know the ceiling is above them, they use like ship directions, right? Aft port, starboard. Right, right. Um, so so they use those, and I think that might help them orient to those directions, mm-hmm. um, and also to where things are, right? Because things are just packed on the walls everywhere. Right. Every wall, everywhere. There's something, um, and that goes into that like resource management that we were talking about earlier, like. When you're using this piece of it, you know, somebody else can't use this piece. I'm, for our listeners, I'm describing two pieces that are really close to each other. Well, like you said, if there's a, fri- if there's a stove or a, heat s- a microwave and a treadmill. Right, yeah. I mean, you can't use all three at the same time. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting. Um, let's see here. Uh, she talked about how the inventory system is inaccurate. They actually use, like, little, um, little flashcards. Colored flashcards, like, uh, to um, organize their stuff, right? So, uh, let's see here. There's no digital tracking of the stuff, right? What do um, you mean? So, so they don't have any inventory uh, management. So, like, say system. for example, they have ten blankets. They have a card that says how many blankets they no, have. No, they have a blank. They have a card on each blanket. Oh. So, so they have different colored cards, and I'm not sure what the colors were. That's why I didn't put it in my notes. But right. um, I think green is like unpacked like we haven't touched this yet yellow is unpacked but we've packed it back and then red is like ready to sh- ship back to earth or ready to blow up in the atmosphere oh okay. um but she was talking about how like stuff gets lost all the time even on the international right there's only so much room and that's what she was saying too is like who put this where and why um like so so people are the problem there but then also like you find stuff seven months later that you're like that's where it is and it's like you're only I guess it's like the same thing if you were to live in an apartment and you misplace something like a remote control and you're like, oh, or like there those it few is times that people get really tired and leave their keys in, um leave their keys in a uh, in the fridge or something on those lines. I've never done that. I mean, you, you hear stories about that is what I'm saying. I, have I, you done that? No, of course no? not. No, uh, I never did that. OK. I don't. So the notes. You. So the notes. Uh, let's see here. Um, she also talked about how like astronauts have a poorly designed schedule um, because it's about specific requirements. It's designed to uh, what's free when, uh-huh. uh, when is uh, their Earth? I'm not sure if they're out of Houston or Florida. I'm not sure, um, but when are they awake? Right. Um, you know, and and when uh, when are they passing over certain places? When is the sun in a certain place? Like, there's all these parameters, and so they design around that. And then everything else is kind of just sprinkled between. And so she said a lot of her job is like organizing her schedule, reorganizing her schedule in a way that still meets all those requirements, but also makes it easy to do. So instead of switching from one task where you're using this thing, (coughs) excuse me. uh, So instead of switching from one task where you're using one thing and then switching to another task where you're using another thing, you're using the same thing throughout two tasks, but doing two different things. And then you switch to the other thing. It's just more efficient. So, like, so she is in charge of her own efficiency. So, if you're supposed to, like, for example, if you got like free time to go look at the uh, the giant dome, right? That's you sign up time to look at the giant dome. You don't sign up time for it, but I, I mean, like, you build just it example. in. Yeah. You build it into your time, but because you also have to monitor, like, I don't know, a passing shooting star or 
a look at what's going on in a weather pattern over Houston or something on those right. lines. Right. You could you would schedule those things at the same time so you could do both tasks at the same time for efficiency. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Um, she talked about the, uh, let's see here. So, yeah. Uh, so, things like due to equipment availability. Um, so, somebody might be using equipment one time and then she needs it for something else. Um, available power. That's what I was about to ask about. That's power. That's something that's there. Yeah, power. Because you can only use so many items at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, time-sensitive requirements, which we talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, she talked about the challenges of commuting to Mars. Come. What would be the challenges? Uh, potentially designing things to break on the way. We talked about this earlier. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, like, the things about break. But I would think also the psychological. How well do you mesh with the other people? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's definitely one aspect of it. Um, and then she talked about th- – there's other miscellaneous things she talked about during her presentation that were pretty cool, like uh, the medical emergencies training, which we talked about earlier, the MacGyver training, which we talked about earlier. That is Man. so cool. Isn't it though? I want to go camping with that lady. And and you know the uh the what she said, uh she said something that like really kind of stuck out to me. So even though they bashed the Martian at the very beginning, they were like you can't fix everything with duct tape and plastic. Right. Um someone in the audience asked her, you know, out of all the space movies out there, which one do you feel most accurately represents space? Uh-huh. And um she kind of dodged the question, but at the same time, she said, the Martian really made me homesick for space. Makes sense. And I was like, wow, that's that's a really cool. I like I will never get that feeling. Yeah. Like I, I, I can be homesick for a place. Right. And I have been. Right. But but not Apollo not, 13. I mean, I, well, they mentioned that one. They, it's they, probably they a little bit too. darker um, idea, you know, but I mean, like they, they I mean, that. That was just interesting to me. The homesick to space part was the interesting part to me. Mm-hmm. It's like, I would think you'd be homesick for Earth. Well, I mean, you probably set up your whole mental idea to be like, I want to be, I have, I like, you know, you, you, you believe in yourself to be close to people or in, you know what I mean? Right, 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 right. Um, you know, and then, and then one last kind of piece of interesting, uh, I guess trivia was that like she was talking about human perception and how like when imagine looking at a familiar object like a glass like a like a cup Mm -hmm. you your mental uh, models kind of or your your mental representation of that cup you know what it looks like coming at it from a horizontal but when you're in space and you come at it from the top down right like you're coming at it and it's it's you're looking down into it it totally meant like that is not a cup to you that. So recognizing objects that are off their axis Whoa. is right. That's really interesting. I never thought of that. Right. Yeah. No, it's, it that was, and she left with that. And I thought, I thought that was pretty cool. It was like, just understand where you live and how your perspective can change based upon the things that are around. This you. must have been such a hard panel to sh- uh, sit through just because every 10 minutes it's like they throw some like, bomb on you that just makes your head go and you're like whoa mind blown yeah Yeah. no it was it was really interesting um oh i wish i was there man this sounds like such a cool i know a bunch of people that wish they were there and i'm so glad i got to attend i'm so jealous of it man you get to see all the cool things i know well that's gonna be it for today guys uh thank you for joining us on the youtube stream if you're watching um if you want to be featured on the show we're all over social media uh, yeah. As you know, we're on YouTube now. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, or Twitter. Or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all of your questions. You can also get to the front of the line uh, by supporting us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on iTunes, the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast directory. We're always trying to keep in touch with what our listeners want, whether it be questions or show ideas, so please let us know uh-huh. what you want to hear I want to thank Billy Hall for helping me out, decipher all this stuff. Billy Hall, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Comstar Cleric and also on YouTube under Billy Hall. Great. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome with two O's. Thanks again for tuning into the Human Factors Livecast. And until next time, it depends in space.